So uh, my colleague Sanjeet uh, Oberoi, who and who's also the product manager for India Spend, and I will claim for uh, today, uh, Sho uh, Shojo Bomik, my former colleague, employee number one at India Spend, now with the Hindustan Times. So any questions you have on us, about us, how we did what we did or are doing, uh, he's as good a guy to ask, uh, who his employer is uh, also the host of today. Uh, what I'm going to do is, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you uh, a little story about why we started and how we came together, what drove us, how we are structured, which I think is different, and uh, how that uh, sort of finally comes together with the product that we've created and the product that we spun off uh, subsequently. And uh, I'm, please interrupt me at any point and ask anything you want to know about us. I'm not a uh, technology guy, so I have no clue about coding or uh, Excel sheeting and mining and so on. But I think I have some sense of what we want to get out of it, so which is what I'm going to talk about. And more importantly, why we started this. And that, I guess, and I hope, will set the stage for why data journalism uh, is important uh, and uh, uh, why we should all be talking more about it and doing more of it and how it will help us uh, help us all as citizens uh, of this country. So uh, our story actually begins uh, with the Anna Hazare movement. So uh, like all of you, uh, most of you, I was watching the whole Anna Hazare movement uh, develop. I think there were three or four things which were interesting about the movement, uh, which I'm sure all of you noticed as well. So one was that this was the first time that the issue of corruption was uh, mainstreamed in this country, right? Uh, until then, corruption was almost accepted as a karmic uh, fate that we have to live with. So someone came and said, no, corruption is something that affects us all, we should do something about it. The second is that uh, it actually created the, uh, a very, very high level of emotional connect and uh, emotional energy so as to bring people out in streets and actually protest and uh, participate in, uh, in uh, uh, dharnas and, 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 and all of that. So there was a very high level of emotional energy involved, and which again was, uh, in a way, a first time for a movement like this. The third thing I thought which was interesting, at least to my mind, and even more so, was the participation of youth. Uh, and uh, never, I think, before, uh, not before actually, for a while had we seen youth participated, participate so actively in a movement like this. Uh, fourth point, perhaps in some ways, a subset of the first three uh, was the use of social media, which again, all of you are familiar with. So as the movement uh, uh, gained uh, uh, momentum and it, it kind of headed to the, the, the eventual conclusion that it did, uh, a couple of things struck me. So one was that uh, uh, Anazari himself wanted the Jan Lokpal bill as the ultimate uh, solution to the problem of corruption, particularly at the government level. Uh, which is something that I disagreed with, many people disagreed with, because we felt that there were laws in this country. But the second part was, to my mind, what was missing in all this emotional energy that was being created was data. So I, I, I was thinking hard, and I said, you know, we've, we're all, we've, all, we've got people who are so pissed off with the system, who are pissed off with quality of education, sanitation, roads, infrastructure, women's issues, but our, our, uh, our reaction to it is mostly, emo mostly emotional. So how do you at least theoretically try and fix the problem? So we said, OK, uh, maybe the element, missing element is data, right? So it's great if you have 95% emotion as a response, but if you have 5% data as a blend, then perhaps your response can get a little more organized and structured. So what that means is, if I'm pissed off with the quality of education in this country, there's no point saying that sack the education minister, throw out the secretary of education, burn the uh, education ministry down. Instead say, let's look at what's what's happening in the Ministry of Education. Let's look at how much money is going towards actually educating school kids. Let's look at how much money is going or getting divided between, let's say, school kids and uh, higher education. Let's look at and ask why is so much money being spent on midday meal scheme, which is good because it attracts students to come through nutritional incentives to come to school, but is it really achieving the objective of educating children, which is what uh, the job of a Ministry of Education should be? Is that the answer? I don't know. I'm just posing a question. And that is what I think India Spend, uh, I mean, that is what I think and I believe India Spend is, uh, it was, was, is, is all about. And that is what I believe we want to do, which is to bring that element of data into every question that we ask, which in many ways will decide what, uh, what will happen in this country when, we, when it comes to accountability and governance, which is, of course, the, 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 the sort of bottom line of everything. So there are two parts to it. One is we said, uh, when we sort of said, OK, if we want to do something about it, let's bring data into it. How do we do it? Uh, should we set up a think tank or should we do something else? Uh, as you can see, I am uh, I'm the last person who could ever think or tank, or tank or run a think tank and do anything like that. So we said, okay, in any case, I've been a journalist and that's the only thing I've done. So let's think of a journalistic product rather than a think tank product. 
right? Not to, uh, I know there are some friends who are from think tank, so this is nothing against you, but it's just my weakness. So that was number one. Uh, then we said, okay, uh, if we create a media product, are we going to say that we are uh, the only source and destination for all issues to do with data? No way. So we will act as, uh, we will do our own mining, we will do our own searching for data, but we will also uh, take data from people who are experts at it. So if the Center for Policy Research or Accountability Initiative does some interesting work or PRS Legislative Research does interesting work, we are more than happy to take it from them and do what we think we do better, which is to tell stories with data. Right? And that, in some ways, is the sort of first principle of India Spend. We tell stories with data or we use data to tell stories. Secondly, we said, uh, I'll just go back. Yeah. Secondly, we said, uh, how are we going to structure this organization, right? So why are people like me in some ways frustrated with the system, right? And because we've all been part of it and in some ways are still part of it. The reason is that the advertising supported model that drives most mainstream media cannot support stuff like this. I understand that. I've, I've run products before uh, and I understand that uh, the revenue model that we have today in most of media today cannot support this kind of stuff, right? So therefore, we had to find another way of doing it. So I looked around, uh, uh, around the world. Uh, there are some very good examples in North America, in Europe, and fascinating examples in Latin America, uh, even in Scandinavia, where people are using the non-profit route, non route to actually build journalism organizations uh, and driven by philanthropic capital. So which is what we, we said the second thing. So one is to do this. Second is to become uh, a more a media product rather than a think tank. Thirdly, let's structure it as a philanthropic entity rather than uh, a philanthropically driven entity rather than a traditional for-profit organization because this cannot be sustained by for-profit, at least as I see. Some of you may disagree and we're, I'm happy to have a conversation on that, but as I see today, this cannot be, uh, it's difficult to sustain it if you want to build it to something else. Uh, so once we said that, we said, okay, now why, I mean, how does this fit with what's happening around the world? Interestingly enough, while the Anna Hazare movement was happening in India, as you can see, there were other movements happening around the world. So it turned out that we were actually part of something that was happening globally. There was an undercurrent of uh, uh, unrest, if you may call it, with people, citizens, including in the Western democracies, saying that we want to participate in government, even though in many, in many cases the governments are fairly efficient. We want to ask questions. We want to ask for data which will allow us to ask more questions and question what we are doing and what the government is doing with us and what are those we elect in public offices are doing uh, for us and with us. So this was happening uh, around the world. What was the key trigger for this? One key trigger for this uh, in India as elsewhere is the right to information. Right? And that brings me to my sort of second principle. The Right to Information Act has actually, I mean, a lot of people are skeptical of it, but I think it has unleashed a floodgate of information and data in this country, as it has in many other countries, almost at the same time. So the the American equivalent, and please correct me, my friends at ICFJ, uh, of uh, which is the Freedom of Information Act, came roughly at the same time that the Right to Information Act came, which is about a decade ago, right? Uh, same, uh, similarly with the UK and a lot of other countries. So the whole sense of information, the demand supply of information, demand from us, supply from government, RTI, and all of that is, is coming together uh, almost at the same time all over the world, right? So that's another sort of uh, uh, mega trend that's feeding this whole uh, uh, the pursuit of data journalism and, and, and so on. So we said, okay, this is a global movement. It's happening uh, uh, simultaneously everywhere. People are beginning to uh, look at data and ask questions. Finally, what, uh, what's happened, thanks to the RTI and the Freedom of Information Act, particularly including in countries like India, is that the governments have got proactive. Governments have realized that responding to RTIs can be a bloody pain. You know where. So, uh, and, and I've seen, uh, you know, it, it, a normal, if it's, if it's a well-worded RTI, and many of my friends here would know this, it can really uh, uh, cause a flutter in a government, or, uh, a government or a state-run organization, right? Because a well-worded RTI will typically ask questions which obviously uh, hint at something that has gone wrong, right? So, and those questions, and, and there are many cases where the questions themselves have triggered action, right? No one has filed a case saying that why has this road not been built or why has the uh, local civic authority played around with something and so on, right? Uh, you just ask a question and people understand that there is, uh, uh, you know, there is, uh, uh, there is a knowledge about this uh, event or the lack of it and therefore are, are, big, are therefore actually react. So, uh, so, and interestingly enough, uh, if you look at uh, most 
large government expenditure schemes in the last, again, four or five years, most of them come with a lot of data, right? There is a quality of data issue, which is a, is a separate one, and we can talk about later. But most schemes, including all the flagship schemes that you and I don't like, actually are accompanied with a lot of data, because the government said that we need to keep aside a certain percentage of what we spend on the overall scheme for data collection, monitoring, and, uh, uh, and analysis. Right? The quality you may suspect, the quality you may not like, but the fact is that it's being done, and this is the first time that it's being done, at least in India, and similarly for other things, uh, schemes across the world. So all of this is really adding up and provides the fuel to what we do or what we are want to do, which is uh, uh, which is data journalism. So I talked about how we uh, started out. I said how we uh, uh, we said media product uh, structured as a journalism entity. Uh, here is the source of supply of data, which is really government getting freer and more open about data. Uh, and finally, the sort of uh, the sense that citizens uh, and people like us want to be participative in the democratic process through this. Uh, th so this tool of data and demanding accountability. So that's the. So here, are, uh, so here's a sort of quick three points on why uh, you know the why all of this serves the larger need, right? Uh, I talked about emotion. Uh, I would take a, I, I'll take it a step forward and say that emotion in isolation is dangerous uh, and unproductive. Uh, the second is that if we want to improve, and I say we, I mean all of us literally, if we want to improve the quality of discourses, we have to do something about it. We cannot be whining about uh, what we see on prime time television and that how that makes us unhappy and, uh, and uh, it's taking our country to ruin. No, I think this, this, this group here can actually drive that change and that's what people like us have tried to do or are trying to do. I also believe in some ways that with some, uh, with some exaggeration that the biggest gap in a citizen's uh, need for good governance and execution is data, right? And and I don't want you to think that when I am I am saying data, I mean uh, you know think of uh, uh, reams and reams of Excel sheets and so on. Data can be a very simple fact or figure, even presented pictorially, right? Each of us the ability to look at uh, uh, large data sets and do the mining and all the tech stuff that goes with it. At the consumer level, people want to know just a couple of things, right? And that's what data is all about. So I talked about the trends. Uh, here are some of the other things that are happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, does everyone know about Net Silver? Yes, no? Okay, so if you don't, then I suggest you check it out. Net Silver uh, is one of the guys who got the numbers for the last US elections bang on uh, by using data sets. Uh, I would suggest you follow him because uh, he sets the, uh, he's one of the benchmark setters for how to use data to tell stories. Uh, ProPublica.org, The Guardian. The two interesting German uh, newspapers, which is in German, unfortunately, but they're pretty good at uh, what they do, and I look at them when I can, if I can understand, particularly the, the visuals and the visualization. In some ways, we are uh, inspired by ProPublica.org, which is uh, the, uh, which is again, uh, it, it's an investigative journalism setup, but powered largely by data. Again, non-profit. Uh, some about three months ago, uh, we were accepted uh, into the Global Investigative Journalism Network, which is mostly non-profits, uh, along with and ProPublica.org is one of them. There are about 80 members. Uh, data journalism, again, as it turned out, is a subset of investigative journalism because finally you're questioning data. Uh, about three months ago, uh, about around the time of elections, one of the things we realized, and this is based on feedback is that uh, people said that can you create something, uh, a, a product or a variation which is a little more consumer friendly. It is spend sounds dense, and perhaps it is. But uh, so we said okay, <laughs> and, and at the beginning we said maybe we're going to focus more on expenditure and therefore India spend, but then we realized that there's so much more stories to tell uh, across health, uh, healthcare, education, infrastructure, women's issues, and so on, that we wanted to uh, you know expand the definition. So we went a step further and we said, uh, let's look at fact-checking, and that's, this is another global movement which is even younger, right? So I was at a global fact-checking summit in London in May, uh, organized by the Pointer Institute, and that was the first time that fact-checkers from all over the world were being brought together, or came together to talk about how we can do fact-checking as another tool to improve the quality of uh, governance and demand accountability from those elected. Uh, so we launched Fact-Checker, and then, uh, so we try and have fun. 
right? So Arvind Kejriwal asks uh, Modi 16 questions. We said, okay, let's do a fact check on each of those 16 questions. And the answers are amazing. You have to see the answers to, uh, to know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, the Congress, uh, uh, India, the Indian National Congress on its website does a fact check on uh, the BJP government's uh, uh, claims. We do a fact check on the fact check on BJP, right? And we had a ball, right? And you have to see it again to believe it. Uh, the, 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 I mean, we are not going, we were not against the Congress or for BJP. Just to, I know, I know these things get a little, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, whatever. Uh, so we we looked at uh, uh, we looked at the advertisements that the Congress uh, or the UPA had put out uh, during the uh, in the run up to the elections. Uh, all those half page ads, if you remember them, uh, the the uh, findings were actually amazing because we found that all of them were accurate, right? So they were factually correct, but contextually they were completely misleading. I can say that I brought down uh, malnutrition in India in the last decade from 63% to 53% or, 40, or 47%. Absolutely correct. Yeah. But I have to say, and I should say, that if I were to compare these figures with China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nepal, I have, they've actually achieved much more than we have. Right. So China, big country, Nepal, small country, Pakistan, mid-sized country, Bangladesh, neighboring countries. So if you look at all of them, so if we were to, and that's the big lesson in uh, in a lot of work we do in India spend and fact checker. So where possible, do not compare only within India, right? Because you need to be showing what is happening elsewhere, and to some extent trying to educate or at least contextualize for the reader whether this data is uh, holding, I mean, standing on its own, or does it need to be held against something else? So these are some of the stuff we did. Uh, uh, there was a headline that, uh, uh, which was quite common about a year and a half ago. Uh, everyone said Delhi is India's rape capital. Does does anyone here agree with that proposition? No. Why? I'm just going by a statement that was bandied about. I'm saying, okay, this is our, this is fodder for us, right? So we pick it up and say, okay, let's let's now look at the data. Okay, so I think he. What's his name? Zafar. Zafar. Okay, so Zafar, I think uh, Zafar obviously has seen the data, and I know a few others have as well. So uh, number one, uh, Delhi is not the rape capital, right? Uh, we obviously look at data when it comes to data which is uh, reported with, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of cases filed at police stations or FIRs filed at police stations, and recorded by the National Crime Records Bureau. So we don't have anything beyond that. Uh, the correct answer actually for that is, uh, and if you have to look at it proportionately, you can't say Delhi, which is obviously more than a population of 20 million, and say that it has so many cases uh, versus another city which may be much smaller. So actually, in India, uh, what are Gwalior has the highest number of proportionate rape cases, right? Uh, even today. Uh, number two is, yeah, so num number two is Jabalpur and Delhi simultaneously. So obviously we're not trying to create a billboard top 10 here. The, the point is something, uh, is something different. The point is that your policy response, which is often driven by our emotional response, will be wrong if we go with the statement that Delhi is India's rape capital, right? Then, because what will happen then is, oh, people say, oh, Delhi is the one which has all the problems. Let's go and find law and order solutions. Let's put money, let's put resources into fixing the problem in Delhi. Whereas what we are arguing is that even for those, uh, uh, I mean, for those who think about these issues and so on, uh, and those who frame policy and policy responses, uh, the, it's, it's, it's all over the place. And sometimes even if those guys who are framing the policy responses know these answers, unless the public, uh, you know, demand, asks the right questions, they will not frame policy the way it should be. And I think we've seen that in many, many uh, uh, situations in this country. So uh, you guys remember this story about this uh, uh, MLAs from uh, Goa going to Brazil for a junket, yes. and uh, they wanted the government to pay for their tickets. So we did a simple thing. We looked at uh, ADR data, actually, and we found out how much each of them is worth. And we said that all of them can afford to buy their ticket on their own if they wanted to, going by their filings two years ago for the last uh, legislative election. So this is the fun stuff we do. We've got all their names and their uh, assets. So this guy can surely afford it. <laughs> okay, thanks.
So this is uh, uh, slightly more uh, serious, I would say. How many farmers does India really have? Someone asked us, they said, do you know how many women farmers are there? I said, we don't know, but we can find out. So here's the number. So roughly 30% of farmers in India are women. Or 36 million of 118 million farmers. Okay. So a lot of our stuff, uh, and then I'll quickly come to how we do what we do as well. A lot of our stuff is, uh, uh, I mean, not all, I mean, sometimes triggered by reports that are released. And we find that many of these reports, uh, I mean, do get carried as a couple of paragraphs in a newspaper, but never, uh, no one spends time or, uh, as, or as much time as I, we feel to go into the data and find some more interesting trends and stories. So obviously we, I mean, we, we do that and we come out with findings like this. Uh, that there are, for instance, 240 million child brides in this country and it's a third of the globe. It's actually based on a UNICEF report. The next thing we do is we create the data visualization thing, which is what uh, my colleague Sanjeev specializes in. So you can actually, if you go to our site, play around with this data and click on it and see the numbers and keep moving the years and so on. We do a lot of stuff on malnutrition. So uh, this is, uh, you know, so the problem, one of the problems with Indian health data is most of it goes back to the National Health Service data, which is, uh, 2004, 2005, yeah, so it's more than 10 years old. So today, uh, and, and remember that India has had phenomenal economic growth in this period, 2004, 2005, even the, the number of uh, people under poverty has come down from 400 million to 270 million. It is logical that a lot of other things must have changed, but we don't have data for it. So in this case, uh, we're looking at a specific data, uh, which was done by uh, the Institute of Population Studies and UNICEF, which looked at Maharashtra and said that how, uh, malnutrition levels had come down quite sharply. So uh, this is a specific group. Normally we look at broad sets of data. We try and look at national data unless we're studying a state in specific. So here what we're saying is that the state of Maharashtra has obviously achieved some progress in tackling malnutrition. It is logical to assume that the rest of the country would have to, but obviously we don't know what those numbers are because those numbers are not yet out and will come with the next uh, NHS survey. So this is one of our, uh, I think a lot of people talked about it, but we feel that, uh, Sanjeev very strongly feels that he was the first to point it out. Uh, and maybe, and I, as an extension, so do I. Uh, our illustrious Rajya Sabha members of parliament attended three sessions and two sessions respectively out of 73. Uh, Sachin Tendulkar three and Rekhar two. Uh, which obviously begs the question, why should they be there then? Uh, but this, and this became quite a big issue, at least for that seven and a half hours or whatever that most news events last. So, next. So this is again some of the fun stuff we do. Uh, don't buy a Mahindra Scorpio in Bombay because that's the most stolen car. Right? I don't, I'm, I'm sure it must be something similar in Delhi. We haven't looked at it. I think Delhi data is not available or it's not available easily. So please fix it guys. So uh, one of the things, you know, when we started very idealistically, a lot of this is all, uh, all of this is very, very idealistically driven, right? So we said we want to reach consumers directly. And, but we realized over time that uh, this is, this product is still too serious for people to consume directly. And therefore we need to also work with uh, news organizations, uh, uh, websites, uh, uh, wire services, and so that we sort of feed them and then they feed the rest of the world. And we also collaborate with articles, for articles. So for instance, uh, uh, the Hindustan Times, uh, uh, Namita Bandare has written, I think, two or three articles now in collaboration with us on women in parliament. So the data and the insights is from us. She's obviously added the opinion and the, ins uh, and the, and the larger uh, perspective on uh, women's participation in parliament. I think she was looking at uh, legislative uh, as well as parliamentary. So that's one example. Uh, there are a couple of other examples with my, which my uh, co-trustee has written uh, in Indian Express, Times of India. So we're writing all over the place. Uh, his name is Praveen. Um, and of course our stuff is appearing on uh, uh, Dow Jones and Yahoo News as a platform. So all the stuff that we do is also available to Dow Jones customers, also available on Yahoo News. So this is how it looks on all these places. Uh, last, uh, early this year we also sort of partnered uh, and ran this initiative where we interviewed a thousand 
candidates across the country and asked them five questions, uh, MP candidates, uh, and asked them five questions. This was all on video. So we said, uh, why are you standing? Who are you? Uh, and believe you, me, uh, except for two candidates among the thousand, almost thousand we interviewed, except for two candidates, everyone answered that question faithfully, including people like Nitin Gadkari and so on. Uh, we said, who are you? Uh, why are you standing for election uh, if you're standing for the first time? Uh, if you've stood for elections, if, if you're a sitting member of parliament, what have you done in the last five years? Two more questions. How uh, are you going to fix the problem of electricity, roads, and water if it's rural? Uh, how are you going to f uh, empower women, uh, which is of, of course across the board, and what's your timeline for achieving this? So five questions. You can go to uh, youtube.com stroke uh, Mera Candidate and find it. Uh, and this is obviously a record because more than 200 of these got elected. Uh, many of them are first time MPs, so this acts as a record. So this we partnered with Google. So google.co.in stroke elections uh, created a destination for the, uh, for the elections. In that, you could, uh, you could actually pick a candidate by PIN code. You go to the candidate, then you could uh, uh, pull up uh, the candidate's parliamentary performance if it was a sitting MP. That came from PRS legislative research. You could look at the candidate's assets uh, uh, by virtue of uh, uh, data filed with, uh, 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 with the election commission, which came from the ADR. And then you have the video uh, where the candidate looks to the camera and answers uh, these five questions, which came from us. So that's still there. So these are some of the things that we do to keep ourselves busy. Um, that's it, okay. So that's all I have. Uh, that's the India Spend story. We are only, all of this is only about 18 months effectively. So we are a, a, a work in progress, an experiment that is still play, uh, being played out, uh, as, not just as an organization, but the very structure I talked about, which is philanthropic, uh, philanthropically driven. Uh, we believe that we have a long way to go as a country uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in when it comes to the sort of whole uh, endeavor of using data to tell stories, but I believe that it's the critical missing point that will make a difference not only uh, to the products that all of you are part of, but more importantly to the, uh, to the awareness that you will create among citizens and basically help make this country a better place.